Olá, bom dia. So, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about speaking to... Um, so, yesterday, I mentioned a little bit about Meta Archive in terms of the Distributed Digital Pre Preservation Frameworks Project and then the Q&A. Um, but today, the focus is really going to be on the the organizational structure for Meta Archive, so the, the framework that we've put in place from the beginning to allow for the continued growth, evolution, and success of the, the network itself as a, a cooperative endeavor. So hence the, the title here, a, a case study in, in collaboration. So Meta Archive really started with this fundamental question, why why would we even consider collaborating amongst a set of institutions when even, even if we're all in cultural heritage, all have similar missions of stewardship of our collections, there are differences between us and what we do and our processes, how we function. Um, and clearly anytime you collaborate, you're going to be finding some compromise between your endeavors, right? Some future goal that you want to attain may be different even from your peer institutions. Um, so it, there's inherently work in that process. So clearly trying to start with this uh, notion of, you know, where's, where's sort of the benefit to each institution uh, by participating as a group uh, to achieve common goals. So out of sort of early conversations, uh, a few sort of sets of principles uh, really designed the, the backbone and sort of the foundation of what, what Meta Archive came to be. So clearly there's a fundamental goal here of, of preserving the collections, right? The, the, the digital materials that institutions are either creating or, or acquiring and collecting um, as part of their missions. We want to maintain the integrity for continued access, so really that focus on access, uh, to be able to make materials available for the short term, the near term, and then the sort of long term unknown future as well. And equally aligned, we want to be able to preserve our institutional missions as stewards of culture, right? In, in any sort of format, shape, or form, uh, libraries, archives, museums, and then broadening out clearly from there, but that was really the focus of the institutions that came together for Meta Archive, to be able to, to continue to do what we have set out to do within our mission, within our sort of goals um, within society. And the risk of outsourcing those core missions to other, to other parties, right, other uh, entities, whether those are commercial, for-profit, even other sort of non-profit entities maybe, uh, considering, you know, the idea of outsourcing those activities, what does that mean for what our institutions are supposed to do? What's the purpose of our institutions if we are taking those activities out of the institutions themselves? And that's a, a dangerous proposition and was a dangerous proposition for the organizations that originally came together as part of Meta Archive. And clearly there are, there are benefits. So trying to, the initial sort of list of thinking about the benefit, benefits that would come out of collaboration, it can be cost effective, right? So when you're, you're sort of pooling resources, especially amongst institutions that typically in, you know, inherently have limited budgets uh, in terms of their overall programmatic activities, uh, but especially in terms of uh, uh, being able to preserve their collections uh, and, and as David was just talking about, the, the costs of digital preservation over time uh, are, are ongoing, right? It's not a fixed cost that you set out at one point and then you, have, you don't need to pay for it anymore. Um, so being able to scale, right? So beyond the boundaries of single institutions, uh, pooling together not only resources of um, in the financial uh, mode, but also as far as human resources and infrastructure resources a, as well. So there's opportunities to scale in different ways. Uh, being transparent, so uh, being able to uh, demonstrate trust, uh, to be able to provide documentation where necessary, to be able to be open uh, both internally to constituents and stakeholders, but also to our, our 
you know, public stakeholders as well, the people that are coming in to use collections or use our data in different ways. Still maintaining control, um, so even within a collaborative structure uh, where there are multiple institutions, still having control over that process, over that design of the collaboration, um, still not uh, ceding control to other, other entities. Uh, being able to be responsive, um, so I'll get to this a little later when it comes to communication, but communication amongst institutions, uh, amongst peers, is really core to being able to grow together and being, being able to have an infrastructure that responds to changing needs uh, and you know, shifting priorities within institutions as well. Um, and also being able to move towards implementation of, of networks of infrastructure that are standards-based, again, trying to get at being a trustworthy entity. So this building process is, doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it, can be, it can be slow anytime, again, when you collaborate, when you're bringing multiple parties together into discussion to, to set goals, to set priorities. Uh, to really determine the, the common solutions for our, our shared problems, this big problem of digital preservation uh, that we're all have been facing and are attempting to come up with strategies together. And the, the really the, the focus here in the talk uh, and the really important piece is the attentions that, attention that's needed to that organizational structure, right? So the sort of higher level uh, common, common goal setting, common policy setting, uh, all of those sorts of pieces are, are going to be key to being able to just do the basic work even of bit level preservation, even in a sort of seemingly simple way. Uh, really the attention needed to develop that, that organizational structure is, is the key part of, of the work. So identifying the common cause, right? What's the, the glue that's gonna bring us together? What is that common goal common entity uh, that we're all coming together to, to work on. Uh, solid institutional buy-in, right, so this is key. And that can, uh, there can be different strategies for obtaining that buy-in. It could start sort of grassroots from the practitioners, the people who are doing the work of digital preservation and grow up. It can also be a top-down entity uh, coming from administration. There can be different ways of, of getting that institutional buy-in. And clearly this is, uh, within any sort of, of project, that, that, that process itself can take time and can involve bringing in outside parties to communicate uh, those needs in a different way. Um, so leveraging sort of existing connect and connections and partnerships uh, can be a part of that process as well. And then again, attention to the terms of the arrangement uh, for the partnerships uh, is really important. So determining within any sort of existing legal or regulatory framework, how is it that our organizations can even cooperate together? What are, what are the existing terms of the sort of political national context that we exist in uh, and even international in that regard that will allow us to even do this sort of uh, simple work of bit level preservation. So those were the sort of fun fundamental principles uh, that were discussed and articulated at the outset of the Meta Archive Cooperative. And so just a little history, uh, the, the cooperative was founded as part of the Library of Congress National Digital Infrastructure Preservation Program funding, uh, which sort of took place between around 2000, and 2000 to 2010, 11. And during those exploratory uh, sort of early years survived on addition, you know, rounds of grant-based funding. So in a sort of experimentation phase to determine if this new entity was even viable, uh, it, you know, it basically lived on grant funding. Um, and with a, with a clear understanding that in order to be sustainable, uh, you know, different sorts of cost models, different sorts of business models were gonna have to be implemented uh, to, be, to be able to live into the future. So that culminated in the, the creation, the founding of a, a separate organization called the Educopia Institute. So that's, that's who I work for. Um, that's a, a nonprofit uh, independent organization. 
And it was really designed and intended to serve as the, the organizational home, the administrative home for Meta Archive. Um, and Meta Archive became the initial, what we call the affiliated communities that we work with within Educopia in 2007. And then a couple years ago, we hit the 10 year mark of, of successfully continuing to exist, but also do the work of, of preservation uh, as a distributed digital preservation storage network. Oh, there we go. So a little bit more about the relationship between Educopia and Meta Archive. So Educopia, again, was intended uh, to, to be a, a sort of uh, neutral center for, uh, to met, for Meta Archive. And it's, our mission is to help sort of catalyze organizations to be able to collaborate together better as, as a, a collective of peer institutions. So an in, in alternative to other collaborative models where there's a, a single lead institution who's really carrying the weight, uh, whether that's administrative, whether that's human resources, uh, even financial resources, um, in, in a sort of network of institutions, there might be a single member of that network that is the lead institution. And there's some risk there as far as being the, the linchpin. So if, there, if the priorities of that institution changes, if perhaps there's a leadership change uh, and that, that uh, participation in the network is no longer seen as a priority, that can be a risk to the sort of overall continued survival of that network. And so the idea with Educopia is that we provide the sort of neutral center. Uh, we provide administrative services um, in order to help that, that collective, that cooperative continue to survive and exist uh, because we have a stake in it, but not the same level of stake as the members that are involved. So it allows the community itself to be independent uh, to be able to steer their own direction, and we're sort of acting in, in guidance mode uh, more than uh, sort of directly involved in that, that direction setting and, and, and leadership. So Educopia has, in addition to Meta Archive, two other affiliated communities at the moment. So we do this for a, a few different uh, types of groups, and these are uh, equally um, in the same sort of way membership organizations um, that have their own leadership groups that set their own direction. So we provide a similar set of services uh, to those entities. So community building, right? So moving from uh, the, being able to assist uh, organizations in growing from idea, sort of research projects, uh, seed phase into growth, uh, evolution, establishing organizational infrastructure, you know, establishing business models, sort of the legal framework needed uh, to grow to a, a stage of maturity to be operational uh, and perhaps move on, go on, sort of go on their own. Educopia doesn't necessarily have to be the continued home of these entities. Uh, we bring network management expertise and that, that's not necessarily just uh, technical network management. Uh, it's also having to do with, you know, how do we bring together uh, networks of institutions in a sort of smart uh, strategic way that allows them to continue to do the work that they need to do for their everyday organizational missions, but also continue to realize the, the common shared goals of participation in the network. And again, uh, in a sort of a backbone way, we provide administrative, legal, and financial services. So filing taxes, you know, making sure all the membership dues are paid. Uh, making sure we have the, the accounting, the books available for people to review. So all of those sorts of entities that in a lead institution scenario can be difficult, if not impossible to even perform uh, due to the nature of what you know, a single institution is, is tasked with being able to do. So these are, again, some of the sort of principles and hallmarks of, of Meta Archive. So I talked quite a bit about distributed digital preservation yesterday. Um, a big piece of it is that with the, the decision early on to, to implement a, a private locks network, so lots of copies keep stuff safe is a, 
open source software that's uh, intended to be the, the, the technological layer to allow for replication of content in geographically distributed locations and then monitor that, that content over time. So all of that infrastructure is embedded within membership organizations. And so through that process, they are maintaining control over their content. Uh, and, that, and that's a process, right? It's not something that they just drag and drop and then the content goes off somewhere else and they hope that everything's okay. They're really clearly involved in all steps of the process um, and are, they are in fact the human resources that, that run the network. My role was really just to sort of assist in that operation, but it's the institutions them, themselves that do that work. And our goal all along has been to make that process of, of getting content into the network ingest and then managing content as, as simple as possible to allow for as many different types of institutions uh, of different sizes, shapes, uh, budget sizes uh, to be able to participate in the network. And again, just, just stressing this idea of cooperative, right? So Meta Archive isn't a vendor. We don't, you don't sign a, a service contract when you, when you join Meta Archive. It's a membership agreement. It outlines the terms of the membership. Um, and, and in that way, there are services that are provided, uh, benefits that are provided from being a member, but there's also a commitment to participation in, in the network. And so when we're, we're talking with people that are interested, we want to be sure that that is communicated, that that's articulated, um, that it's different from sort of other vendor relationships that, that institutions might have. Um, and it really comes down to, again, Part of the, the aspect of that the hardware and the software assets are, are owned by the members. They're the one making those purchases and connecting them to the network. Um, and the fees, the membership fees and the storage fees go into a central pool that supports the ongoing maintenance just of the technical network, but also the sort of overhead and administrative layer that, again, comes back to those, the legal services, the fiscal services, those sorts of uh, pieces as well. So in practice, um, uh, LOX is designed to be compatible with almost any repository system. That said, there is always configurations <laughs> and troubleshooting that has to occur. Uh, so this is actually an area that um, we are investigating much more closely starting earlier this year to determine if we can in fact design uh, more simple, easier ways to get content into the network. Um, as I referenced a little bit yesterday, uh, Meta Archive is, is, is preservation storage, right? So we don't do any sort of, we don't provide services for, um, you know, the sort of configuration of the submission information packages, any sorts of selection, appraisal, analysis, um, any sorts of preparation of the content should happen at the member institution with whatever tools or systems that they want to implement, and we will work to connect the storage piece of Meta Archive into, into those workflows. Um, but it's really up to those institutions to determine what's best for, for their own institution. Um, and in addition to this, this sort of basic benefit of, of replicating your content in multiple locations uh, and, and monitoring that, that content over time, Meta Archive was designed from the outset to be this community of support, right, to, to build knowledge about digital preservation together to be responsive to the needs of members. So as research data became more prevalent within um, academic libraries uh, in the role of the library in helping to curate and manage that data, uh, Meta Archive designed you know, a series of research projects to investigate how can we be sure that our network can support what's likely to be a growth of ingest of that content into the network over time. So again, basic, basic processes wise, the, the producer, the institution will determine those curation practice, they'll bring those to the Meta Archive. Multiple copies are then dispersed across geographic, political, environmental lines. Um, so in a basic way, there's the institution which is sort of the box of content and then that's replicated to multiple locations across. Uh, and then there are regular checks and repairs that occur across the network. So in addition to basic integrity checking, if there are errors, 
um, then those errors are investigated and if a copy needs to be replaced, that's an automatic repair and replace process. So that's due to regular communication that's going on between all of the, the storage nodes in the network. Um, so that's very brief. I could go on for another half hour, uh, but I'm really trying to focus on the sort of governance model of, of MetaArchive. But it's important to understand, again, that all the members uh, involved have ownership <laughs> over all the hardware and software that goes into to the configuration and setup of these, of these nodes. And uh, we employ uh, more of a, a deaccession cycle. So if, um, if a member wants to delete data, uh, there's a process for doing that, but it's, it's not necessarily overnight. Uh, it's, that said, there is, it, we do support being able to delete data when needed, but again, designed as a preservation storage network, uh, it's not necessarily the same level of immediate access to that data. And it has to do with security to allow, to ensure that um, we're sort of protecting the content that's in there and limiting the amount of access to, to that content. It's, it's dark storage, right? There's no access component directly built in. The idea is that members would have access versions of their data in some other sort of local repository or perhaps some other shared access system. MetaArchive is really for the disaster recovery scenario. So here's a list of our members. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of universities, it's a lot of academic libraries. But some of our most recent members are, are smaller institutions. So the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum is a small, a small museum. Um, it's within the sort of Harvard ecosystem, um, but it's its own independent entity. Uh, we have a public library. Uh, we have a, a, a sort of foundation archive center as well. And this is this is an area that, that's actually growing in the membership and, and uh, a direction that we're, we're, again, sort of looking at our infrastructure and thinking about the types of changes that need to be made to allow, uh, allow those institutions that maybe can't support uh, uh, spinning up a, a server and a storage node uh, to be able to still ingest content and participate in the network. So that's a that's a conversation that's going on within the membership, within the leadership group to determine um, if Meta Archive should, can, and how they might grow and evolve in that way. So we're international, clearly mostly still in the United States and on, on the sort of eastern part of the, the country, um, but we do have some international partners in both Spain and Brazil, which allows us again to achieve that geographic uh, distribution across multiple boundaries, um, and we are really one of the only private locks networks to have that, that sort of range of distribution. There are a number that are in continental locations, um, but we've been pretty successful in that regard and would love to continue to grow uh, where possible in international ways. So membership level, um, the sustaining members uh, pay the most, but participate the most. Um, I'll talk more about the, the leadership group, but as a sustaining member, um, you get a direct vote on the, the leadership group, the steering committee. Um, collaborative members, that's probably the, the newest membership level, a few years old, and that was, again, designed in response to what we were hearing both from our, our current members and also prospective members of sort of existing consortia or existing collaborations of small institutions that had limited resources, didn't, weren't necessarily all able to join as, say, a preservation member, but could, could sort of band together um, and invest in a single institution uh, being the sort of the, the node home uh, and still participate in the network. Um, so in that way, even the costs of the Meta Archive membership around you know, $2,500 a year for a three-year term could then be distributed amongst a, a set of smaller institutions as well. Um, so in addition to membership fees, which again go into the sort of pool of the, the operations to run the network, there's the, the cost, right, the, the purchase cost of maintaining a, a server and storage space over a three-year term, and then there's storage fees, which in terms of the landscape of costs are, are pretty reasonable and were also recently uh, reduced in response to 
uh, decrease in storage costs and also the needs of membership. Um, and that was, a, again, a decision that was passed by the, the steering committee, the leadership group within the network. So membership is designed to be uh, as part of a three-year term, and that was really to, you know, in part allow for the continued sustainability of the network, right? So we can predict um, how many members we're going to have across a longer period of time than, say, just an annual membership process. It will allow us to be able to respond to, you know, uh, membership growth and decline in a more sort of reasonable way over time. Um, and the other big piece here, again, is the responsibility of members to monitor their collections. So we have, we have a collection management tool that provides members a window into their content in the network, um, and that's, that's ongoing participation. So it's not that you put the content in and then you don't worry about it, um, that you know, it's really all my job to ensure that the content is there. It's really up to the members, and we have a series of mechanisms to allow people to perform audits on that content, um, just you know, basic integrity checking. Um, which are ongoing, but someone could trigger that if they wanted to, to generate reports, um, to get a sense of, of how their content is being preserved. Um, just gonna move on for time. So principles-wise, as far as governance, these are some of the, the big ones, right? So it's independent, right? It's independent from Educopia. It's independent from the institutions themselves. It's its own entity. It's, it's nonprofit, um, so we're not looking to generate additional revenue beyond the scope of our operational activities, um, and it's member-owned, operated, and, and governed, right? It's really the members that are deciding upon uh, all, all levels of the organization. And part of that uh, gets embedded within a series of documents, right? Uh, so there's the charter that outlines the missions and goals, governance that uh, outlines roles and responsibilities, and then the membership agreements that are, that's sort of the key initial uh, commitment document between uh, a member and the, the organization that outlines those terms. And so these documents are important for a number of reasons, um, clearly being able to demonstrate transparency uh, to uh, both internal members, but also to the, the larger community about how Meta Archive works, how, how it functions. Um, but also to provide accountability, right? So this really outlines the terms of, of those relationships between members and the organization. And if, you know, if someone violates those terms, if there's a breach, then there's, you know, there are the, the uh, outlined uh, procedures that would then occur um, to, to mitigate those situations, um, which really to date has, has not occurred. Um, so leadership is, is a big piece, and so in a, in a uh, membership organization of over 50 institutions, so again, because of the collaborative member uh, structure, we have more institutions than was just on that list there. Um, so within that, uh, there's going to be different levels of member engagement, and we want to provide the opportunity for uh, different member representatives to participate in the, in the decision-making process for the overall group. So that's the primary go governing body and responsible for overall management, coordination, communication. Again, one member from each, one representative from each sustaining member, but all voices within the, the Meta Archive Cooperative are, are provided a space in, in really big, important decisions. Um, there's always a process of surveying the membership to get feedback, um, to get their, their input, um, and, and it's always, in any sort of collective endeavor, it's a, it's a series of discussion and conversations in terms of policy setting. So, for instance, the, the reduction in storage fees uh, definitely sought and uh, included feedback from, from multiple member institutions before that decision was made. So this is these next two set of slides, and I'll try and wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, are are really trying to get at, in addition to just getting a technical network up and running that's supposed to do the the basic work of digital preservation. Meta Archive is really set out to be to be this community of practitioners, right? To be able to to grow together, to share knowledge, uh, to be able to do the the 
accomplish the basic goals of preservation, but continue to, to move forward towards unified goals. Um, and so, again, Educopia serves a role in being that common neutral center, so my position as community manager, but that work is really distributed amongst the membership as well. And so I have to sort of work to find that balance to engage the membership, to set out, to work with them, to, to set goals for smaller projects, for higher level strategic directions, and move forward together in that way. So we have infrastructure to help support that. We have committees and working groups, uh, which look at uh, different areas. So there's the leadership group with steering committee, there's committees that focus on different areas, so preservation has looked at everything from you know, file formats to uh, now they're, they're investigating web archiving uh, formats and determining workflows for getting those materials into, into Meta Archive in a more automated ways. Um, the technical committee, technical committee has looked at infrastructure changes and that sort of spawned or created a new working group, again, to look at what sorts of changes we need to be able to make to, again, support smaller, limited resourced institutions. And so those committees engage in research and development activities, and their outputs really inform a higher level policy and strategic directions for the overall cooperative. So it's not just the steering committee that's setting all of these things, it's really through the, the activities of the the ongoing work of the committees, um, which also serve as opportunities for member engagement, right? So that, again, this is not just a, a vendor agreement where your, your content is, is just being preserved on these different locations. You are, in fact, participating in, in the activities of, of the work of the, the cooperative as well through, through committees, through engaging in these sort of ongoing questions. And so communication is big. Uh, we, we have monthly calls, which are just discussion topic focused, so anything from evaluating our current membership levels to, again, looking at something like what's going on with web archiving formats, who's doing that, how can we better support that. Um, those sorts of, uh, sorts of discussion topics are designed to provide opportunities for members to communicate about what's going on in their local institutions and are there shared sort of common practices that, uh, that people can work together on. And then we have an in-person meeting for the steering committee and then a virtual meeting halfway through the year. We have a regular listserv for, for communications and then a, a, a wiki to provide both technical documentation and now we've transitioned into Google Drive to you know, be able to share and provide uh, access to meeting minutes to other documentation, again, trying to achieve that goal of transparency so people know what's going on even, even if it's not a committee that they're working on. So just to wrap up, um, and hopefully this has come through everything that I've already said, but the sort of foundational elements that have allowed Meta Archive to exist for over 10 years are really the cooperative framework, the sort of attention to designing that organizational framework, having a strong organizational center, but that still is limited, it still has limited dependence on any one single mem member. Um, then we have this collaborative model that we're achieving, geographic diversity and distribution, that that expertise is embedded across all of the member organizations. It's not just one single member that's doing all of the work and therefore growing all of the knowledge and expertise within one centralized location that's really distributed across the members um, and then allows people to maintain cost-effective options um, and they're doing the preservation in-house and doing it themselves. Thank you.